It's been um, uh, uh, a great few weeks. Uh, we've had seen God do some amazing things. Um, for those who are not aware, um, I've just come back from being in Thailand, so had a little bit of family time, uh, but also went with a couple of um, the guys to uh, a missions conference in Thailand where we got to connect with uh, some of the people that we support across the globe who are doing incredible things. Uh, and I met with um, a couple of people and I've got a couple of videos that I want to show of some of the things that we get to support. Could we have that first video, please, Simon? They're the Muslim tribal group from which the Taliban emerged in the 90s. They have a zeal for religion, but they have no proper knowledge of God. So their spiritual hunger and thirst have been channeled down wrong paths for decades to create terror and war. This makes it almost impossible and highly dangerous to engage in open, face-to-face -face witness and discipleship. Even after decades of Christian witness, the Pashtun still do not have a visible church of any form. Believers are few and most are wary of sharing their faith with family and friends for fear of repercussions. Amidst all this, Roshan Productions seeks to bring the message of love to proclaim the good news of peace with God and salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. The majority of Pashtuns are rural, so radio is the best way to reach them. We produce a wide range of audio content for different segments across the whole of Pashtun society educated, uneducated, men, women, children, and we broadcast 90 minutes of Christian radio programming into the region every day. Increasing urbanization is bringing internet access into semi-urban areas, creating the environment needed to leverage our radio content through the internet. The growing importance of using smartphones for content delivery in the region has been confirmed by the dramatic increase we have seen in the number of people downloading and using our Pashto Stories app. The number of users more than doubled in the first half of this year, and our Android app is now installed on over 6,600 active devices. By the end of June, Pashtuns had downloaded over 28,500 videos and 10,000 books to be used on those devices offline. Pashtuns like to listen to religious broadcasting and talk shows about religious matters. They also like moral stories and social dramas with a religious core. Pashtunradio.org has been redesigned to make all our radio series accessible on all the main podcast networks. And since literacy is low, our Bible website, Pashtunray, will provide an audio Bible solution using all of our own recordings. And PashtoTV.org will provide a range of Christian video, music and TV programs for the region. And we're backing this up by building a new social media presence to promote the content. We also partner with other Christian groups to make all our audio, video and printed materials available for distribution through their channels, either digitally or physically in the form of books or SD storage cards. Thank you for your partnership and please keep praying for us. So this is uh, one of the projects that we are backing that at the start of the video that we didn't quite hear was talking about where it is, which is Afghanistan and Pakistan, where uh, you can't freely share your faith. Yet there's people on the ground over there developing apps, uh, writing messages uh, and sending it out across the radio uh, and through internet access. So thousands upon thousands of people are hearing the gospel in a country where it's almost impossible to do that. Pretty incredible, right? These guys are spending hour upon hour upon hour of getting these stories. They do these interactive um, radio like conversations and storytelling and um, all of this incredible stuff. Uh, and I was going through some of the, the stats and stuff that the, um, the guys were showing me and they are getting some amazing momentum. The traction they're getting is next level because they've tried to do it uh, tr traditional methods before and found a lot of uh, sort of 
a lot of barriers and, and hurdles to get over. But now they're putting it into story form and uh, audio form and people are lapping it up. It's kind of exciting, right? In a space where it can't be spoken, it's being spoken. At a place where it's always been hard to get the gospel out, it's getting out there, which is really, really cool. Uh, and you guys are actually part of that. You're already part of that. You've been part of this for many years and it's really cool. Um, there's another little video I want to show in a second, um, which has been something that wouldn't have usually been the, the bread and butter of the organisation, but there was a major need that occurred last year. Um, and so we were able to partner with uh, an organisation to, um, to help that need. And I'll let the video speak to it. Some of you who have been around for a while will recognise the voice that is narrating this video. <laughs> The Taliban takeover of Afghanistan in August 2021 shocked the world with its ease and speed. This precipitated a new wave of refugees into the neighbouring countries, particularly Pakistan and Iran, who did not welcome these new arrivals, having seen so many come since the 1970s. Those Afghans who were in the military or worked for the previous government became instantly vulnerable to violent reprisals, as were any who were associated with foreign groups of any kind. The three million minority Shia Hazaras, who are traditional enemies of the Pashtuns, also faced persecution by the mainly Pashtun Taliban. Of special interest to us were the many believers among the newcomers, also targeted because of their faith. Some Christian groups who had been working in that country began to contact our team for help to resettle their staff members and friends. And so in September and October, we began helping these families with some believers and Bible translators among them. In November, we decided to sharpen our focus to find some of the poorest of the people and begin a family support program. Firstly, we provided bedding, housewares, and a one-room carpet for the place they had already found and rented in their own names. Next, we arranged proportionate monthly food, as family numbers range from 1 to 11. We also give a set amount of cash for their monthly rents. Our Afghan field coordinator oversees food distribution and gives out money for rents, helped by a young Pakistani and two Afghans. All workers in the program are believers. From January 2022, we are supplying food and rent for 126 families at a cost of Australian dollars, 25,000 every month. About a third of these that we help are widows with children. Every family has a story. Here are two of them. A woman who saw her husband killed in front of her eyes managed to flee with her four children, two of whom are disabled. So many families have been torn apart like this, with many killed or missing. It is vulnerable ones like these we seek to help. A Hazara man had received threats because of his faith. In God's providence, he was in another province when the Taliban came to his house, but they took his two younger sons. The family fled to Pakistan and some time later received a phone call. Somehow, his sons had escaped to Iran and were free. In June, they were able to rejoin their family in Pakistan. We want to express heartfelt thanks to every person and church who have responded to the needs of the Afghan refugees and have donated generously and enabled this family support program to become a reality. One of our Pakistani brothers calls it hospitality, which is a fitting word to describe his neighbourly love for these people. We are grateful and feel greatly privileged to be able to help vulnerable Afghans in this way. Christ said, I was a stranger and you took me in. I was hungry and you fed me. Powerful stuff, right? Powerful stuff. It's quite easy to... Uh to forget that there is 
some real atrocities taking place across the globe, um, but it's also easy to forget that we can actually be part of the solution and in helping which we are. Uh, there's been floods of um, Afghani refugees coming across the border into Pakistan and to be able to be part of helping uh, to find them homes and stuff is pretty incredible. The stories are heartbreaking, but God is finding a way through that and you guys are part of that. I'm sharing these things with you because um, I think it's important that we know what we're doing and why we're doing it. When you uh, fill out uh, a little giving envelope like this and you go, yep, I want to uh, give weekly to our um, missions arm, to our art outreach arm. It's important that you know where that those funds are going, amen? Um, and they're going to really, really good things. Uh, we also have a Bible college in Pakistan that's um, near my Bible college that had 42 graduates this year in the last 12 months. 30 of them are in active ministry and three churches have been planted. Pretty incredible, right? Pretty incredible. Um, we went to uh, this conference where, like I said, where I met with a couple of the people and a couple of the guys um, came with me and I thought it'd be really cool to hear from them, their experience uh, of, of coming to Thailand to, it's called a Pan-Asia conference essentially where you get, uh, you know, missionaries from all over the world they come together um, and and pastors who support them come together so that we can worship together encourage one another hear what's going on and network um, and so a couple of the lads came with me so if I can invite uh, Jacob and Wade up to come and share a bit of their story can we give these guys a hand I just asked them to um, Lawrence was going to be here but Lawrence isn't well today but I just um invited these guys to come along with me and then I asked them if they could just share what they got from the experience. Cool, thank you. Uh, yeah, look, it, it, um, as we kind of saw on the screen, uh, confrontational is, is the word that comes to mind. Um, I mentioned last week it was kind of like a room full of Jeff and Sue's uh, and, and it really was. It, was. it was a room full of people, you know, there were sort of the, the distance I am from you and they're kind of... They're telling these stories about, you know, we had to run. There was, there was one guy there that, that mentioned that, um, I, think, I believe he was from Cambodia, that they came into his house and beat up his kids in the night. We just can't, we can't even comprehend it. You know, like, it's, it's hard to even put into words the, the stuff that these guys are going through simply for their faith. You know, it's, it's easy for us to come to church on Sunday and, you know, we, we clap and we sing and we listen to a, a great sermon and we feel empowered and inspired and we go away with the best intentions for the week. But these guys literally live it 24-7. It's, um, it's, it's absolutely incredible. You know, I, I don't think I really grasped. I was, I was talking to, to David who, who's um, seen, seen a lot of this stuff firsthand and I was saying to him, like, it's, it's crazy the, the level of understanding he must have for this and we, we can only sort of grasp the, the beginning of, of what this is and it's... Um, yeah, I, I think in a word for me, confrontational. Um, it, it really put it into perspective uh, just how lucky we are, um, but how much support these guys really do need. You know, they're, they're in, they can walk down the street and, and be blown up. And there, were, there were people there that were uh, in Beirut for the, the explosion in Lebanon. Um, and while that wasn't necessarily a, a targeted attack, you know, we've got people here, these guys are on the ground providing aid and providing help for, for victims of that. It's. Um, it's so incredible to see. Um, so yeah, look, I think that was that was it for me. Was um, was the confrontational and the the, the realism, the the real, yeah, meeting the people that are that are actually doing this. It was yeah, quite eye opening. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Wade. Um, I've just written something down. It's probably a little bit easier to share, but yeah, I'm I'm so grateful for this place. You know, one of the biggest things that was declared to me straight away was that I'm planted in the right church and chosen church really wants to raise us up, you know, raise up disciples and Pastor Aaron's really supportive and the whole team here. So, yeah, thanks, guys. Um, I journal a lot. So one of the things that I've written here is um, it's 11 p.m. at night, sitting in my bed, relaxing after a long day. What a day. Just to sit in the same room with all these phenomenal people. How good is God? God pr brings people together from all areas to worship him. This walk is forever changing. From what I learned today, be open to change. Be open to developing something new. 
Be open to a new conversation or a new word. Don't hold back from sharing a word from God. Share your vision. Take chances and throw away the script. You know, we are all individuals, every single one of us, and not one is more important than the other. And sometimes we doubt ourselves, we have fear, we have worry, but all of these people started from such small beginnings. They're all pioneers, right? And um, it starts with a seed and it grows. So don't be afraid to step out, you know, like I was only saved last year and now I'm up here and with all of you. So God is phenomenal. Just take action, guys. And if you want to get out on the field, this place will support you, 100%. You know, we're all here. So I think, like, giving is so important. If we can't go there, if we can give, let's support and then grow the kingdom. So, yeah, thank you, guys. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank you. It was, um, it's interesting how you can go somewhere for a, you think you're going for a certain purpose. Um, and then whilst you are in that place, uh, God kind of highlights why he really had you there. Uh, and often it can be different, a different reason why you are there. But um, it, we had a great time. Um, and to be honest, for me, like, God was definitely speaking to me. It was a powerful time and um, some amazing ministry took place. Um, but being able to um, spend time with some champions from our church who, um, you know, keep seeing God afresh and remind me to keep seeing God afresh, to keep pressing on, and that nothing is insignificant. Every little uh, act that we do in obedience to God is actually really, really powerful. Uh, which leads me to my message today, which I've entitled, Faithful Where Your Feet Are. Faithful Where Your Feet Are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you uh, for the amazing opportunities that you continue to pour out for us, uh, the opportunity to be part of what you're doing in this city and beyond. Lord, you are so kind and so gracious, and Lord, we are excited to see all that it is that you have in store for us as a church, but more so what you have in store for the church, your church, on a broader scale. Help us to stay keenly attuned to what you're doing, to not get complacent or comfortable, Lord, but to keep running after every opportunity that you put before us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Colossians 3. Colossians 3, verses 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. I've shared this piece of scripture. In fact, I've alluded to this message a number of times because for me it's very powerful and it was definitely something that um, I reflected on whilst we were away. A number of years ago, many moons ago, many moons ago, back in the day, back in the day, uh, Christy and I made a decision and it was to take a leap of faith to dedicate all of our time to ministry, to not just do Sunday church and the occasional connect group, but to actually dedicate our lives to serving God and the church. It was uh, an interesting time. I actually was reminded of this whilst we were away. A friend of mine, Pastor Paul from New South Wales, has a uh, similar timeline to me. Um, but this moment when I kind of prayerfully considered um, giving ev everything up in my secular world and focusing completely on ministry and the church, uh, I was at the time a cabinet maker slash carpenter and I was 33 years old. Does that remind you of anyone? <laughs> Messiah complex. But I was. It was interesting. I actually wonder how many other people have that story because I know a few people who were about the same age and were working as carpenters and then got called into full-time ministry. Um, but I didn't actually know what that 
next season would look like. I didn't know what it was going to look like to take that leap from, you know, working from six in the morning till six at night on the tools to then uh, devoting my time to pastoring and to to sharing the gospel and ministry. I was passionate about the word, but I didn't even know what steps to take to do that. I knew that God had spoken to me from the time I gave my heart to him. Every year on was always about getting full-time ministry. The moment I met Christy, she said, uh, I said to her what I wanted to do. She said, what do you want to do with your life? I want to be a pastor. And she goes, I'm never marrying a pastor. So I stayed a carpenter until she married me and then became a pastor. (laughs) Strategies, everything. But I didn't know what I'd have to do. I had uh, no idea how I could fit in uh, studying, serving the church and family all at the same time. At at this stage in our marriage, we had uh, three children of our own. Um, we were fostering my nephew who was a baby. Um, there was some pressure on. There was some responsibilities. There was bills that needed to be paid. There was, you know, things that I had to take care of. Um, and it was felt like an impossible situation. It was a, a season where I'm going, I know I'm supposed to take this leap, but how do I do it? I'd previously been to Bible college Uh, and got a few qualifications, as you do, but really sensed that um, if I wanted to commit my life to God, I needed to be pretty deep in my word. I needed to really understand the scriptures well. So we decided I would go back to full-time Bible college uh, whilst working, whilst serving in the church to see if that would open a door, Um, which, strangely enough, it did. But in those times where I was studying and then working, and then serving in the church, and studying and working and serving in the church, and then getting home, and all of that, knowing that we were just about to take this uh, leap of faith, I hit lots of times where I was really, really discouraged. Like, this just isn't going to happen. I'm not getting any, nobody's patting me on the back. I'm not getting any acknowledgement. Nobody's seeing the hard work that I'm doing. Why isn't this working faster? Why isn't it happening faster? And I remember Christy gave me this Bible. And it was a Bible to encourage me in what we were doing. And I'm certain I've read this to you before, but this is really, really important. And it changed my life. She wrote in the front of this Bible, we've just made this decision to give everything we have to serving God and to dedicate our lives to the church. And she wrote this in this Bible. Dear Aaron, I hope this Bible gives you wisdom, guidance, answers, sermons, and brings you closer to the author. I love you, and God has so much planned for you and for our lives. And I pray that as you follow the instruction of this book, your life will be blessed. I know that God has given you your job to tell others about him. And I pray this book goes with you everywhere. Then then the, the scripture, Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Whatever you do, do it heartily, as though to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord. Powerful. This scripture, this particular Scripture impacted me amazingly, just so, so powerfully. And I hope today it does the same for you. This is one of those scriptures for me that is uh, write it on a post-it note and put it on the mirror in your bathroom. This is one of those scriptures that's worth reading every day. This scripture I've read so many times It was in the front of my Bible when I was studying at Bible college, so I'd flick through it and past it every day. And it helped me push through hard seasons. It's helped me to stay on track when I felt out of control. It's helped me come back on the right path when I was veering veering off course. It's helped me stay positive and determined. It's helped me stay calm 
when all I want to do is scream. It's helped me stay faithful where my feet are. When we realize that what we're doing isn't for people but it's for God, it changes something. It changes our outlook. It changes our position. It changes what we think are wins and losses. It changes how we feel about it when we know we're doing it for God. This scripture still helps me. The trip we've just been on was a powerful trip. It was really good to hear so many stories and it was a great reminder to me personally to keep persevering, to keep pushing forward. God spoke to me really clearly about not getting discouraged but keep moving forward and reminded me of this scripture again that I'm not doing what I do to please people, I'm doing it because I'm serving God. Now, if people can be pleased in this as well, that would be great too. <laughs> but the truth is, we have to be serving God first. And I know without a shadow of a doubt that there is people in this room this morning who are feeling a bit discouraged, who are feeling in a season where they feel overlooked, where they're not breaking through, where they're not getting what they thought, where things aren't happening the way they hoped they would. It might be something you've tried to start and it's just not getting there. It might be recognition at work that you're not getting. It might be a sense that you just keep hammering and hammering and hammering, but you don't seem to be getting anywhere. Well, can I encourage you to get this scripture on your heart, to keep working at it because you're doing it for God and not for man. It's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to start feeling like you're hitting barriers. But we have to remember why we are here and who we are living for. When we were away, we were in a room not too dissimilar to this. Um, and like I said before, it was made up of a couple of different groups. Essentially, you had pastors and you had missionaries. Um, and we heard some sermons from pastors that, are pastoring like mega churches, you know, with thousands of people. Um, and they're amazing communicators, they're doing amazing things. But then we also heard from pastors who are gathering weekly in their homes with five people. And I couldn't help but think, God's just as pleased with both. We like the look of lots of people. We think that that's a sign of success. But some of these people are actually making more change with their five or ten than some are with tens of thousands. More deep change. Both ministries are powerful. It actually got me thinking about the Apostle Paul. Because the Apostle Paul is such a well-known guy. We talk about him a lot and all the things that he's done because he's done so many things. So I've got a little list here uh, of a little bit of a timeline, if you will, to give us an idea of what Paul has done. Is that okay? Good. Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm excited. Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm really excited. <laughs> all right. Me too. Me too. So there's this guy, we call him the Apostle Paul. We'll hear a little bit more from the text in a second, but I want to give you a little bit of a rundown um, of who he was. So, the, so Paul wasn't always called Paul. He was Saul and he was trained as a Pharisee, right? So a religious leader, a Jewish religious leader. He was sent out to hunt down Christians. So he was anti-Jesus followers and sent out to hunt them down and imprison them and take them back, right? So that's what he started off. So trained as a Pharisee, knew the words, studied it, all of that kind of thing, Old Testament stuff, went out to hunt uh, Christians. He then has this encounter with Jesus whilst on the road that transforms his life, then starts preaching the gospel he was then hunted for his faith like he had been the hunter before. There's a story where he had to escape through a hole in a wall and be lowered down to avoid arrest. 
He travels all over the place, from city to city, preaching the gospel, seeing and doing incredible things. He wrote Galatians. He wrote 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. He travels a bit more, planting churches and preaching the gospel in temples all over the place. He then writes 1st Corinthians. He travels a bit more and then writes 2nd Corinthians. Then he writes to the Romans. Then he travels to Jerusalem and he's arrested. He's transferred by ship and then he's shipwrecked. Then he's put under house arrest and he writes Ephesians, released from house arrest. He's in Rome. Then he travels to Spain. He writes 1 Timothy and Titus. He's arrested again and writes 2 Timothy. And then, long story short, he's martyred for his faith. Right? This guy has had an epic life and written a third of our Bible. He's put it all down so we know what happened. An absolute legend in history and that's just a snippet of what Paul did in his life just a snippet in his time Paul was definitely faithful where his feet were everywhere he was he was faithful to the call of God to being obedient to what God called him to but I want to uh, take a quick look at where it started. Turn with me to Acts 9 with your Bibles open. Acts 9. I'm going to read a chunk of this scripture uh, which outlays the beginning for Paul, who was previously Saul. It says this. Meanwhile, Saul, turn to the person next to you and said, Saul became Paul. So meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, right? So he was hungry for hurt. He did not like them at all. He went to the high priests and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any who belonged to the way, that was Christianity, it was called the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So he was out for hunting down believers. Man or woman, he didn't care. He wanted to hunt them down and imprison them. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly, right, so he's gone, he's out on the road, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the voice replied. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. Now we read this and it's kind of like, oh yeah, whatever. You've got to picture what's going on here. This dude's walking down the road, this bright light just knocks him down and then a voice starts talking to him who claims to be the one whose disciples he's hunting, right? That's, that's going to do something to you. That's going to say something to your heart. Verse 7, the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but didn't see anyone. Saul got up from the ground but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and didn't eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. Say, Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him and restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. 
But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and he was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Amazing, amazing story of how God can transform a life in a moment. And we love reading about all the amazing things uh, that Saul, now Paul, did on his journey and in his ministry. All the amazing work, all the amazing writings, all the amazing miracles, all those amazing things. And we always think of Paul, the Apostle Paul. It's a big name. It's a name we're like, yes, I'd love to be like Paul. But not all of us are meant to have a big name. There's another guy in this story that none of it would have happened unless he was obedient, unless he was faithful where his feet were. There is no Paul without the obedience of Ananias. There's no scriptures that we read unless Ananias was obedient and faithful where his feet were. We want the big lights, we want the stage, we want the promotion, we want the accolade, we want to be known and God just wants his message out there. He wants us to be obedient. It actually reminds me so much of the people we met overseas when we were on our trip. People who are pioneering new ministries. People who are simply being obedient to the call of God on their lives. I think I mentioned last week about a lady named Penny. She's like four foot nothing. She's gone to a place in Japan where there, in her city there is no church and never has been a church. She started meeting with three or four people in her living room uh, and then just recently um, purchased or got uh, the opportunity to get a building, which isn't a big building, I think there's still only maybe 10 people, but it's the first church in that city ever. Ever. And then two months ago, I think it was two months ago, she was telling us about the first baptism. They've had one baptism in the whole ministry. Just one. But it's the first baptism ever in that city. Amazing. Amazing. We think of big numbers, we think of lots of people, but she is changing a city. She's responsible for that change by being obedient to God, faithful where her feet are. What seems like not much to you and to me could be incredibly significant to kingdom endeavours. You think about Ananias going to pray for this one guy, I'm just one guy going to pray for one guy and then this one guy turns out to be a carrier of a message that spreads the earth. Pretty amazing, right? All because Ananias conquered his fear, was obedient to God and when he laid hands on the man, 
and prayed for him. That's all he had to do. Lay hands on the man and pray for him. I'm pretty sure that everyone here can lay hands on someone and pray for him. Amen? I'm pretty sure everybody here could conquer a little bit of fear of how you might feel. Because our fear is more about we might look silly or sound silly or not have the right words. It's usually not that this guy's going to kill us, arrest us or imprison us. And all we have to do is be faithful where our feet are. You, you have a significant role to play in the carrying of the gospel message. You have a significant role to play in serving God. You are significant. You might not feel like it all the time. You might look around and you might feel like you're in the shadow of everybody else. But if you're faithful where your feet are, you could change the world. You could change the world. You may not get thanked. You may not get recognition. You may not get platform. You may not get written about. You may not get spoken about. But whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. I was um, putting this, I don't know if you call it a sermon, an idea, a thought, uh, together, And it was impacting me because I spoke last week about the idea of um, being tired, that we can all feel tired and all of that kind of thing. And and that before I went away, I had a little bit of annual leave as well, that I was feeling a little bit tired. But as I processed it out, I thought to myself, I wasn't physically tired. I'm a, I'm a bit of an energetic person. I'm a sanguine personality. I like being around people. I like doing things. I get excited easy. I like talking to people. I like new things. I like adventure. And I wasn't physically tired. I was thinking about that and I go, oh, I wasn't spiritually tired either. Like, like I'm hearing from God. I'm talking to God. I love the Bible. I love praying. I love talking about God. I love being in church. I love all of that. I thought, well, if I'm not physically tired still wanting to run, run on and change gears and keep doing new things and all of that. And, I, and I'm not spiritually tired. I'm still sensing God and hearing from God and not in a dry season. Then what is it? And I realized maybe I was getting emotionally tired where I'm expecting something from people, accepting, expecting some kind of pat on the back, some kind of accolade, some kind of positive response that I'm not seeing what I'm expecting. Just maybe, just maybe I'm expecting something from people rather than just being faithful where my feet are at. And that was starting to make me tired. There's so many different things and discouragements and barriers and hurdles that we face in our life. But when we remind ourselves that it's God who we serve, the weight gets lifted and we become refreshed. So if the musicians could come and help me. My hope this morning is that for anybody in here who's feeling tired, who's feeling discouraged, who's feeling the weight, who's feeling unnoticed, who's feeling like they're running and running and running but not getting anywhere, like being on a treadmill, my hope is that Holy Spirit will give you a fresh revelation that it's not about the accolade of man, but it's about the love of God that drives us forward. That whatever we do, we can do it with all our might because we know who we're serving and why we're serving Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful for your love. Lord, we're so grateful that you have made us many, but all different parts 
with different ways, with different things that we're supposed to do. One body together in unity. Even from this morning, sharing communion together, all together with one focus and one mind. But Lord, you've given us all different things to do, to serve you. Lord, we want to be faithful with where our feet are. We want to be faithful with every opportunity that you've given us. Lord, we want to see that all we do is for you. To share the gospel. To adopt people into family. To see lives transformed. To shine light into dark places. To show the love of Christ to all that we meet. Lord, whether we are called to be like Paul or whether we're called to be like Ananias, we want to be faithful with what you've called us to. But Lord, we need you in that process. Lord, we need to hear you clearly. We need to sense your presence. We need to know you on a deeper level. Lord, we want to be close to you. We want to understand you. We want to carry your heart. Lord, we want to see what you see. We want to hear what you hear. Lord, help us to have a heartbeat that mimics your heartbeat. We want to walk in step with what you're doing. And Lord, we ask that you help us to be so content with your love rather than needing everybody else's. Lord, help us to be so content to be in your presence rather than needing presence. Lord, help us to know that your embrace is better than any pat on the back we could get from anyone else. Help us to realize, Lord, that you are all that we need, that your call, that your voice is all that we need. And Lord, as I pray right now, Lord, Holy Spirit, sweep across this place, reminding each and every person in here that they are significant, that they are called, that they are chosen that you have a plan for them, a role that they've been specifically made for and specifically called to and specifically empowered to do. Lord, in this place right now, may there be a deep sense of your presence. May there be fresh revelation and conviction. And may we be reminded that we have to keep on moving forward. To be dedicated to the gospel. To be dedicated to our relationship with you. To be committed to searching and studying your word. To be committed to prayer and intercession and relationship with you, Heavenly Father. And Lord, that we're called to be together in unity in common unity under the church of Jesus Christ. We're so grateful for all the amazing things we do when we come together. We're so grateful for the joy it is when we encourage one another and when we see you working in and through our lives. Lord, continue to have your way in this place. Lord, I pray and I petition and I ask this morning, Lord, that you raise up young ministers of the gospel, Lord. Mighty, mighty young men and women to be carriers of the message. Lord, I pray and I declare open heaven over this place. Signs and wonders, spiritual gifts, Lord, that there'd be a transfer of wisdom and experience from old to young. That those who have seen you move in powerful ways, who have been carrying the message for many years, Lord, would embrace the heart of the Father. 
and be mothers and fathers of the faith as they encourage and equip those coming through. And Lord, I pray that we'll walk together in great unity, side by side, arms linked together, the old, the young, the in the middle, on a march towards heaven, Lord. And Lord, the picture I see as I declare this is us reaching out and grabbing more people and linking arms with more and more on our march towards heaven and inviting people into the family of God, adopting more and more people, people from all places and spaces, from every age and people group, getting to know you and being released into the calling on their life. Lord, may we be a people with excitement in our heart, with gratitude overflowing from us, a people who look to encourage, support and lift one another up. And may we be so, so aware of your presence, Lord, your voice and your word. Have your way in this place. Thank you, Jesus. With every eye closed and head bowed, nobody looking around. If you're here and you know that you need to give your heart to Jesus, you need to give your life to Jesus. You want to live a life of significance. You want to live a life open to his calling. Then today I want to give you that opportunity to make Jesus Lord of your life. So like I said, there's nobody looking around. But if that's you this morning, you know that you need to make a decision today to put Jesus first, to acknowledge him because you know in your heart of hearts that that's where your inheritance is coming from, your reward is coming from him, then all I'm going to do is ask you just to slip up your hand where you are just so I can see you, so I can pray for you. I'm not going to call you out the front, but if you know that you need to give your heart to Jesus, just your hand up just so I can see it. Is there anyone here this morning? Just feel it on the inside, bubbling away. God is speaking to you. I see that hand. Well done. Very courageous. Is there anyone else needs to come into right relationship with the Lord? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let's just repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I acknowledge my need for you. I accept your love. I put you on the throne of my life and from this moment forward I promise to acknowledge you and honour you for all my days. In the mighty name of Jesus, Amen. Amen. Can we give God a clap of praise? Very good. If uh, if it is your first time here or you've been once or twice but um, we haven't got to meet you or get to know you, can I encourage you to hang around after the service, come and grab a, a coffee. There is a, a couched area just in the corner uh, of the cafe area there. If you make your way there, uh, one of us will love to come and say hello and get you a coffee or a drink of some kind. Um, but hang around, say hello to someone. How about trying to meet somebody you haven't? met before. Imagine doing that. That'd be pretty good, right? But have an amazing week. You are dismissed. <laughs>